Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm John Allen Simon. It's my great pleasure to be your moderator this evening for a very intimate Q&A with the fabulous seven-time Emmy-nominated, Emmy-winning, Tony-nominated, uh, national treasure actor Holland Taylor. <laughs> That's pretty daunting. I am pretty dusty. I it's all say. downhill from there. Yeah, on, I, 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 I fear it. I fear it. Well, uh, <laughs> being a filmmaker, which makes me an amateur psychologist, I like to begin at the beginning. Uh, so let's talk about your childhood. You were born in Philadelphia. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I was born in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I had one of those those privileged childhoods from, an, from another time, which I don't think exists anywhere now, where you left your door unlocked at night. And I was allowed to wander anywhere I wanted at any age, and I mean, and I did. It just seems so very different now, but I also had a room that, that my room looked like a guest room, and so did most other children's rooms of my generation. You didn't have like things up. You know, there was no posters, you didn't have your guitar up on the wall. It, you didn't, it looked like a guest room because there was not this decorating, this claim your individuality, be who you are, show who you are, have your favorite things up. And it, that was generally true, I think, of my generation, so it was kind of strange. But at some very early age, and I don't really know why, I wanted to be an actress. The, long before I saw a play, actually, I, I and I don't even know how I found out about the theater at first, really, because I mean, I guess one hears about it. I guess we had some sort of theater at school, and there were plays, and you did plays. But I was 16 when I saw my first professional play. And now, your you know, mom was a painter, and your dad was She was, was a painter. My father was a lawyer. And my, I had two half-sisters who were significantly older, so they were not ever, we were never in the same place, you know. So you they were in a way, to some was, extent. In, in, a, in a sense, and in, again, in that, in that era, in that particular kind of people, you, children could be just left quite to their own devi devices, and I think I was a playpen baby. And I think, I, might, I remember my mother saying um, to me that I was a very placid, happy baby, and I, placid, I think, is maybe because I was completely unused to being involved in any conversation or you know, of any kind. So I was just sort of like, <laughs> you know, what happens next? Because I, I just didn't have anything to compare it to. And my mother said famously, and I think she was very charming when she said it, she said, of course, until you learn to read, I didn't know what to do with you. Yeah. <laughs> now think about that. You know. And I did learn at quite an early age, but that sort of left from, from you know, when do you start walking and waddling all about two, one and a half. Depends how so slow or fast you one, are. So like from one and a half to four and a half or so. I, <laughs> my mother did not know what to do with me. And I don't think anything was done with me, actually. And I, I learned to read because I was looking at comic books. And I think I asked one of my sisters, what are, what are these white, you know, what are these little lines in this white, th these balloons? And she said, well, that's, <laughs> that's what they're saying. And I said, that's what they're saying? Oh, you know, and I was able to read pretty quickly after that. That was an amazing concept. Were you yeah. reading Wonder Woman? What were you reading? I, I don't know. Just some, whatever comic books, you know, they threw Archie in the play, they threw in the playpen with me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it maybe, was a it, maybe it was the comics. Maybe it was the comics. Uh, and uh, were your parents interested in the arts? Your mother was. Yes, my been. mother was. And my, you know, my father was, I mean, you know, they just let you unfold however you will. And at some early age, I, I think we, we didn't get television until I was about 12. Thank God. I mean, in my case, I think that was great. I was a big reader. And when we got television, there were all those great shows, that, you know, the Sid Caesar show and the Jackie Gleason show and all of those. And, and I think that I would imitate them and stuff like that. And I just got into it somehow. And I just said I wanted to be an actress. And I think my parents, my mother got me the books that one gets 
you know, young people. And I subscribed to Theatre Arts Magazine. I'm sure I couldn't do that by myself. So, you know, it was cooperated with to a degree. And then when I went on to actually really mean to do it, I think my mother said, I think you should. Did you ever take typing in high school? You know. <laughs> and I've just been very, very lucky. But I never had any question about it, really. But it sounds like, uh, in a way, you were thrown back on your imagination. I you was. Know. I was. And I, I, at the risk of being uh, you know, mawkishly personal, I took some psychology courses not long ago when I, I went to USM and took a master's degree there at University of Santa Monica. Someone nodding there. You know that program? Yes. yes. And uh, you know, the whole idea was to study the different stages of development and, and, and look for ways that you could look at that in real life at school or, or examining your own, your own history. You had to look at your own history in terms of the things that you were studying. And uh, there was, at some point, one understood that little children, and you see this, and I see it with, I see it with children, I even see it with animals. It's really very touching. Um, young children who are playing and very excited to play and rushing this way and that, and every so often they'll stop and they'll look back you know, at their mother or, you know, or their father, and then they see that the, they're, the, they're looking at them, and then they go back to what they're doing, and every so often they check mm -hmm. to make sure they're being, they're being watched over. And, and, and sometimes waved, go ahead, you're wonderful. You know, it's, that's part of our development, is to have that. And I actually did, in fact, not have that. And I think there is a need to, uh, to play with someone watching. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually do truly think that my impulse to be an actress has a lot to do with that, to be at play and do something that I do sort of naturally and have somebody watch it. And, and, but I'm in Cary, you know. And, and uh, now obviously, I think all children, all people who go into show business are in some way showing off. They are showing themselves. They have a need to do it. But at a very early point in your career, you start having, um, how shall I say it, you know, professional interest in, in it, your abilities. You, the values of it, the skill of it. And so while the underlying force may be, I want to play with people watching and making sure I'm OK, is that uh, I, I, you develop a very refined, increasingly refined ability. And then you start having professional values. And, and you want to do something better and better and better. And any time, and this is true of a, any number of friends I have, that you're in a play that runs for a time, you're endlessly working on it and perfecting it. You say, God, I finally have figured out that scene after seven months or whatever. Uh, or I've been doing it wrong all this time. Jesus Christ. So it's, 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 uh, there, that's what you're consciously dealing with, is your professional knowledge and skill, your, your degree of excellence your desire to be excellent, your desire to lift yourself, your desire to lift the audience. Those are the conscious things. But underneath it, there is that thing that got you out there. What about growing up? Were there actors or uh, plays or movies that really inspired you or made you I was dream more about affected this? by plays and, and the life of the theater, because I got some biographies of, of bygone you know, heroes of the theater and the Lunts who were still on planet Earth at that point, and Helen Hayes and Catherine Cornell and all of the, and all the great actors, and I would read biographies of them, and uh, you know, I loved the life. I loved my idea of the life, and it, and when I started doing it, which was in summer stock when I was in my mid-teens, but really more when I actually really started doing it in New York, I got a Broadway show very early when I first got into New York. I did a, a play called The Devils, which was a, a big production with Anne Bancroft and Jason Robards. I had a very small part. From the Aldous Huxley novel, the mm -hmm. adaptation. Yes, of the John, well, John Whiting. John Whiting's yes, correct, exactly yeah. right. That Ken Russell did as a yes, lovely movie. Yes, it's a movie, yeah. Lovely is my, maybe and not the right word. Quite remarkable. 
And I just love the idea of executing that thing of going to the theater, the life of going backstage. I, I love New York theaters, how crummy they are backstage. When I play some sort of institutional one, like Lincoln Center or something, it feels really weird to me. The, the, you know, the cinder block walls, the metal stairs. It's too nice. The, the windowless. And, and like, it just doesn't feel like a theater until you get out there and then say, oh, OK, this is, this is the theater. But you know, I like, I'm a real traditionalist. And at Bennington, you studied. Uh, oh, then I did a lot of theater. Then, yeah. And by the when I was in high school, I had those summers at a summer stock theater, and I did a lot of theater in high school. And at Bennington, you actually could major in drama. So I was always doing projects and acting classes and a couple, four or five shows a year. Did anyone say, hey, you're really good at some point when you were 10 or 12, or at some point where you thought, well, maybe this is something I should, I I should think do? It, I think, uh, I don't think I, I think there was never any question in my mind but that that was what I was going to do. And I don't think I was waiting for anybody to say, hey, you're good. And I didn't feel that I was that good. I mean, there were some things I thought, well, I can do that. And other things I thought, well, I'm not, I, don't, I, I don't think I can play that part. And that's continued on. I mean, and I don't think I can play every part. I was offered uh, Blanche in, in some regional theater company of uh, um, streetcar. And I said, it's not my part. I, I can't play it. I don't know how to play it. I don't know. I do not believe I could play it. I could play Stella. So what was the first play you were ever in? <laughs> you could play which? Stella. Stella. <laughs> the first play I was ever in professionally was Blue Denim. And the boy who played the boy was named Jimmy Seacrest, who's since gone to his reward. And he introduced me to Geraldine Page, whom, mm. he, had, whom he knew well. And that was my first Broadway play, was Sweet Bird of Youth. Which, that's my first, can you imagine that is your first Broadway play? You know, and I imitated her for the next several years. Um, <laughs> and my, my mother took me, Jimmy was off somewhere. I mean, we, I went after we had worked together, and he arranged for me to get tickets and everything, and, and, and to meet her afterwards. So I was, just, I was just beside myself. In this production was Paul Newman, and you know, Rip Torn, and, and Mildred Dunnock. I don't know if that name even means. And, um, oh, who was the ingenue? Blonde ingenue. Shoot. Wonderful actress. And, and it, was just a, it was just one of the great productions of William. It was just who had a, directed it? God, I don't even remember. You don't I mean, remember. You know, I was, I was, you know, whatever I was, 14, 15 at the time. And I went, and my mother took me for a matinee. We, I, we lived outside New York and trained up, and she and I wasn't going to take her to meet Geraldine Page. Oh no, no, my, my mother wasn't going to come in with me. I said, just wait here, I'll be right out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so children are so horrible, aren't they? I certainly know I was. And I, I met Geraldine Page, and Page says, "Well, sit down," and, and she was eating her, you know, between shows meal. And she was a real slob. I mean, she was a, <laughs> you know, she was tossing papers this way and that way and eating with her fingers and everything, which I thought was like, just fabulous. And she had, I remember to this day, two lamb chops and a salad <laughs> and uh, some chocolate pudding for dessert. And she ate the lamb chops with her fingers and pieces of the salad with her fingers. And we talked like at length. And she was in incredibly dear in that she actually sort of you know, gave me some sort of notion that. I could be that too. I don't know why she was so kind. I really was like 14 or 15. Maybe Jimmy had said, give her a break. And um, so then I was there for a really long time. And I walked out in the days and I suddenly thought, my mother, my mother, my mother's all this time. And I've been in there like an hour. And I thought, oh my god. Never had thought once about it. Thus, parents should just understand that this is quite possible. And then when I got out there, she had, she had gone across the street where she could see the kind of alleyway and she'd had coffee and whatnot. What and she saw me come out and she came on and she was very happy. And I said, oh, mommy, I'm so sorry. I just forgot you. And she said, that's all right. She was very tolerant. And so she was always tolerant as I went on. And I think she sort of couldn't believe that I steadily had a career and always have had one and I've never 
made income from doing anything other than that career. And I've never had no income other than my income. So when you graduated from Bennington, were you, were you in a lot of shows there? Did you get the kind of parts you wanted? Was it the sort of experience that yeah, you well, would Bennington recommend is a, to is a, young is actors? Yeah, well, Bennington was a small school, and, and, or it was then, and I was sort of, you know, the actress, and I, and I, I certainly could do it a, all right. And they sort of, <laughs> they sort of had to give me the parts. You know, I, they had I to a, give them to well, you? Well, they did in a way. I mean, we wasn't like a big university. I mean, I was... I, but sure, surely there were some other women there besides and they you. they played the other parts. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I, don't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't play all the leads and everything, but I played most of, mostly leads. And then there were other leads that I wasn't right for. You know? <laughs> but I did, I played a lot of, you know... Like 40 year, I played a lot of 40-year-old women, you know, at, 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 at 18. As, uh, you know. I was always playing, you know, Mrs. Railton Bell in... Whatever, and this is not the other, you know, older women. And did you do Shakespeare and the classics? No, was that we, well, I did, I did uh, some uh, Oscar Wilde, and I did for my senior project, I did a, a big chunk of Schiller's Mary Stewart, and I did Wilde um, from The Encounter from, what's the very famous Wilde play? The most classic Importance Wilde. of Being Earnest. The importance of Being yeah. Earnest. And then I did, a, we did the second part of the evening was the whole one act of the chairs in mm. Esco, and that was a big night. So I mean, it was had a lot of range. Mm. You know, a great leading woman to an ingenue to an old lady, and very different writing styles. So when you graduated, you just went off to New York. You packed your suitcase, yes. and yeah, did you know anyone? Did you have Not introductions? Did you have an agent? Did I you don't remember even how I began. I went to open calls. I don't think I. I had an uncle there who. Occasionally gave me a meal and told me not to try to go into the theater. <laughs> and, um, and you listened very carefully to his I advice, I understand. I really don't know how in the world I started. And I don't know how anybody starts today because numerically it's just so much harder than it was. I mean, I don't even know if they have open calls or what open calls even mean anymore. I mean, I got my first Broadway play from an open call, which was, which was The Devils. And I don't. You played one of the nuns. I did, I did, and I, 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 I made friends. I made two very good friends. I made one friend from in that show. She was one of the other nuns, and then her good friend and I became very good friends. So the three of us were best of friends for a good decade or more, where we just sort of did everything together. And then you attach to other friends, and I mean, I didn't need lots and lots of friends, but. I made them silly, and, and I did not have any kind of ins. I did, had not gone to Yale. I wasn't a member of any group. I didn't have any inside track, I did a, absolutely nothing. And there were ways that I wasn't very good in certain kinds of things. And auditioning was very, very hard, as it is for everyone. And um, sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. And I, I got an agent fairly early. And again, I don't even remember how. Isn't that extraordinary? that I don't remember how. Well, I've had a couple of different agents over the years. And, and I, uh, let's talk a little bit about auditioning. Oh, it's a very, <laughs> it's a very interesting subject. Um, I don't have to audition as much as I did, of course, but there are circumstances. I, you, have that, you have that situation where you have to have a meeting, which is... Um, a kind of audition. Which is a, a kind of audition. You certainly are wondering what, you know, what, how am I going to, what? And sometimes, you, and sometimes you get along with people and, you know, you strike up something that feels like a kinship or a connection, and, um, and that, that feels good, and you have a rolling conversation, and then you're thinking during it, uh, should I leave now? I've sort of overstayed my stay. What could he, how could I show him? What you, you know, so that you are very uncertain, and that, you know, what is a conversation if one party is very uncertain? But I do have some thoughts about auditioning, which I are, I think, interesting observances and might be helpful. And they are things that I do not always hold on to or remember. First of all, no matter how much you know, no matter how secure you are, no matter what, no matter how well you might take my advice now, an audition can go south. And when it starts to go south, you just have to pray that you can get out gracefully as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and, 
and I have overstayed my welcome in a few of those, trying to make up for it by saying something, trying to, with nicety, and I'm thinking, like, oh, and you're, you're just killing yourself. You're never going to get over this if you don't get out, you know. And so it's just, that's just chemistry sometimes. There's bad chemistry with a person or a frank dislike. I mean, oh, I had one director, she'll go nameless, who I disliked so much that I, I, I'm sure I ruined the audition. And I, his, his manner with me put me off. And they, he, ca he called me Holly, for starters, which I thought was an odd thing to do. I mean, it's even to someone who's named Bill to call him Billy would be a little odd. But I mean, Holly is a, is a sort of a, or, you know, a typical nickname, and Holly is an unusual name. And I, and, and I just liked him so much already, I said, oh, for heaven's sakes, call me Miss Taylor. <laughs> It was already screwed by then. Now, did you book the job? No, no, no. <laughs> no. It was already screwed by then, as I'm, as I'm sure you can say. But let, me, but let me try and say something useful about auditioning. First of all, you really want to try and come in from the point of view of colleague. Because often you are at the colleague level. And sometimes you're better and more talented and wiser and more experienced than the people for whom you are auditioning. And I don't know about you, but I do best when I'm auditioning for people that are really good. And when I think the person I'm auditioning for is a schmuck, I'm a, ridiculous. I can't do anything. I'm just, it's like, I, you know. So you know, your heart isn't in it, and you just think, oh, just get me out alive. So, but if you, you must come in from the point of view that you are not a supplicant. You are someone who has something. Maybe they want it. If they don't want it, it really doesn't reflect on you. And I beg you to remember this because it is so profoundly true. And also, you won't know how you're doing. So your minute by minute assessments of how you're doing are wrong, for starters. If, it's just like being in a play if you think you acted that shit out of that scene. You probably were terrible in it. And uh, you just, you don't know what you're doing. So you have to try to get your critical mind out of there. And like, for instance, if, you, if you've ever met someone who you were prejudiced against for some reason, and then you met them, you thought, well, he's not that way at all. He's a, he's a great guy. And you suddenly sort of had, some perception fall away, and you suddenly relax, and you're suddenly interested in another person. And that's the way you want to somehow be in these situations, because you don't know, and you want to be ready with your humanity, with yourself. You want to be ready. And if it, if it isn't accepted, or if it isn't chosen for the job, that is not really your business or your problem. You couldn't have done anything to make it turn out differently. Uh, now on a practical level, of course prepare. Know the material pretty thoroughly and have thought about it. Always carry a script, even if you know it very well. And um, have some different attitudes about it. Do have the point of view that you could play it anyway. That you could, you could do various kinds of entrances and various kinds of points of view. Try not to be locked into, well, it's like this, because that's what the character's like. Because it could be like any number of things. You have to understand that along with not knowing what they want, you don't know how you're doing to such an extent that once I auditioned for something that I really wanted, that I had had an inside shot for in the sense that the director told me he wanted me for it, and we discussed it. It was something at Yale, at, uh, not Yale, at uh, New Haven Rep. And then, then he, wrote me a note and said, I'm not going to be directing that after all. Oris Hussein is, who is an English, who is a, an English trained, English born, East Indian man. And so my heart fell because I essentially had the job and it was one I really, really wanted. And so I prepared the material, but I didn't necessarily prepare it in the best way in that I sort of said the lines a lot and did them a lot. I don't think that's really the good way to do it as much as being very familiar with it and having lots of different thoughts about it. being able to do it 
with silly accents in different ways, sort of break the frozen idea of how you should do it. Do it with a French accent, goof it up, but just try and get to the sense of what's really happening in the scene as opposed to how you would do it. So anyway, you mean in preparing before? In preparing, yeah. absolutely, of course. And um, so I, but I did this audition, and the guy who read with me, you know, the dramaturg, I can't remember whether I knew him at the time. I don't think I did. Maybe he was just familiar to me. Then like 12 or something years later, I'm waiting for an audition, and he's waiting for an audition too, and it's Ms. J uh, J um, John Tillinger, who is a director and an actor. And he was a director by then, but, but I'd seen him in lots of shows, and he, and he said, and we had never met, and he said, you and I met when you gave, I read with you, you gave the best audition I have ever seen in my life. Wow. Okay, I did not get the job. Not only did I not get the job, but that director never said anything to me, that Indian guy. He never encouraged me or discouraged me. He, he was just dismissive and curt. So I, of course, since I'm uncomfortable in auditions, I quickly felt, well, I felt horrible during it. I was horrible during it. I was horrible. I was terrible in that great part. I lost that part and so forth and so on. Well, I didn't. He had someone else in mind for it from the beginning. He could not have been more different from me. So I wasted all of those bad opinions of myself. Uh, are you hearing me? Because you all do this. We all do this. So, and I, so I discovered in sort of a rush that when we say, I'm going to go get that job, and you feel good about it, you say, you know, or I, I got that job, or I didn't get that job. Well, let me tell you, you can't get a job. You can only be given a job. I've said this before. I've said this publicly, so you might have seen a film where I said something like this. You cannot go get a job. You can be given a job by other people. It's not, it's not how are you going to get it? You're going to rip the script out of your hands and, <laughs> and then get a, get a contract? Just give me a contract. I'm going to sign. What are you, how are you going to go get it? can sneak and, under the Warner lot dressed right. as Catwoman, I suppose, but right. then you don't get it anyway. Right. But I mean, you can't, you can't even get it by necessarily earning it because they may feel someone else should have it. So you have to go knowing that it's not in your power to get it. What is, what's not an action? It's a description of something that happens. You getting a part is a description of something that has happened. You've gotten a part. Does that give you a freedom to be more playful I in the room? I think so, and it, it gives me a freedom to not feel like everything I do is, you know, I, I used to, if I saw I had a run in my stocking as I was walking into the room, I thought I'm gonna kill myself. <laughs> you, know, you know, things become too important and ridiculous. You, you, all you really can do is have looked at the material and have a sense of it, Bring yourself, hopefully, as fluid as you can and as open as you can to it. And uh, try to be responsive to the room. Try to not make your assessments of what the director is thinking of you or doing, but, but try to really hear what he's asking you to do. If he said, you know, could you pick it up? Then you know, when, maybe you know that you're perhaps <laughs> indulging it or, or dragging out playing moments. You see, you feel yourself and you see other actors where they're just playing each moment, 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 like it's, like it's its own little flower. Well, it isn't. It's part of a thing. And it's, you have to have motives and reasons for what you do. Very light. You just have to touch lightly in your mind on what the character is doing for it to affect your behavior. For instance, Stella Adler gave me, she was my teacher, she gave me, and, but not until I was in my mid-30s. Mid-30s, I went to her. In so. New York? Or? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was already as... I was already a professional actress who'd worked a lot, and so that's a good time to study with a great teacher, of which there are very few. Her, her book I would recommend above any, before any other, The Art of Acting. So she would say a long speech, which we all look at when, we, when we've been hired and we've got the script, we listen, we're like, oh, look at that, oh my God. And it's like big, long, mm. And then at an audition, you think, oh, this big, long speech, and then you worry, how will I do this? She said, a long speech is nothing but stuff that gets in the way of you getting to the point. 
you have to remember that a long speech is something that you can, there's a lot of stuff that you have to say in order to have put out enough information to justify your getting to the point of it. So you, it's not that you necessarily hasten through it, but it's like climbing a hill. You can climb over this and climb over that, and kick that rock out of the way and climb up here and climb up here to get there. So a long speech is going somewhere, and you can break it down. The first part is going here, the second part is going there, and the third part is going there, and then I'm there, rather than lingering and swilling around in every moment. Do you understand? It's rhetorical. There's a logic to, if yeah. it's well written, to, yeah. the, to a long speech. Yeah. Especially Oscar Wilde is very good at that. Well, even, but even so, there's a drive. There is a human drive to get to the issue at hand. And maybe, indeed, the speech is, is uh, toying with someone, which would slow it down in a way if you're toying with someone. But you still have to have that final thing is where you're heading, and you don't want to forget that. Uh, but the main thing to remember is that showing up as yourself as available to them and to the moment as you can is, is, is what you need to ask of yourself. Not go get the job. So looking at it from the other side, uh, what can a director, what would you like a director to do at an audition? How would you like a director to greet you or behave? Well, what helps? Um, just making sort of a human kind of contact is good. And just, you know, just, just sort of, uh, well, because sometimes if they see 50 people in a day, even saying, hi, welcome is, I mean, that's saying that is enough. Um, and, well, see, directors have difficult tasks. Uh, Mike Nichols said casting is half of directing. So if you have a good sense of casting a person who will bring something maybe that you hadn't ever thought of, I mean, look what happened with Dustin Hoffman doing The Graduate. That's crazy casting. Yeah. But it was just an instinctive thing that he th thought. So you have to be alive to your instincts. Directors have to trust them. Um, I, I really got, you know, I really don't know what I, I don't know that I would ever be a very good director. You have to give a person, oh, you know what Doug Hughes said to me? Um, the director's job he say it, is to rid the room of fear. Mm. Yeah. To help the actor relax, really. Yeah. Feel safe. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's what I've learned in yeah. doing this yes. work. Yes, and directors saying things like, you know, some, some kind of work is laborious, it takes a long time, and, and if ever an actor expresses, oh, how am I going to do this? You'll get there, you'll get there. To express to constantly remind the actor that it's a process. Because it is a process, and the audition, of course, undermines that. And audi the audition process makes, you know, they want you to give an opening night performance. They want to see what the, what the performance would look like. Well, that's a lot to ask. And you can't get it all the time, so I think And still hint that there's more that you would give, too. Yeah. You don't ever want yeah. The person on the other side to think this is all they're going to, they're mm -hmm. all they're no. going to get. No, not at all. So, but that's just built in the job. But pretty challenging to direct. So once you've gotten the job, talk a little bit about how you prepare. Is your preparation for stage or camera are they significantly different? Well, I think the preparation is for the piece, and this is why I want you to read um, Stella Adler. Adler. The book, The Art of Acting, is she talks about how acting is doable. It's fil filled with things that you do. It's not a state of mind. It's not thinking about yourself or your personal history or, you know, imagining or, or putting someone else in, in front of the in front of the other actor to react to. I mean, that's a challenging thing to do. Here you've got a real person that you're acting with, and you're trying to imagine someone else there to react to them when, hey, you could use the guy who's right there. You know, There's a lot of uh, crazy ideas about acting that are out there. And um, she would talk about how doable it is, and she had lots of exercises to, sh to show that. And that book is very worth reading. But also her, there's uh, two volumes now. Farrar Strauss is the publisher of her of her lectures, which were recorded on Shaw, Williams, Inge, you know, 
uh, Chekhov, uh, Williams, um, Ibsen, two volumes of this. And the, these lectures are, are taken from tapes, so they're repetitive, of course, and they're conversational. But that's fine because she had to, you know, you have to repeat when you're teaching. You have to get the same idea different ways and drag people through it. But why she was so great was the, and this really is the answer to your question, was that was the way she would read a script, particularly a, a, a script of a real play. And we're not talking about a soap opera script or some crap script that is not a thoughtful piece of writing. Thoughtful piece of writing, particularly classics and some of the great plays, the way that you read them is the way that you ask the questions. What questions do you ask? You certainly have to understand the social background of the play, and you have to understand the social background of the character, but certainly your character in relation to the others, the class. I mean, that's very important in English in literature, but it's important in American as well. We have to understand the physical and social and historical background of what the character lived in. That, that gives you a lot. And you have to understand the style of the play. Is the play dark? Is it light? Is it realistic? Is it a style? Because that, that, that doesn't change the core thing that you do, but it has a lot to do with how you do it. So if it's a style, you better study up on the style and see other things done in the style or film of other things done, or read about the style, particularly if it's a, an extreme style. Commedia dell'arte comes to mind. Uh, but also, like Shaw, you speak very clearly, usually, and in an extremely presentational way in Shaw. It's ideas. You, that doesn't mean you can't be a person, but that's the style of those plays. Uh, in Shakespeare, there's, you, know, there's, you don't act between the lines in Shakespeare. You act on the line, the line. It's, you know, it's not realistic modern acting. It can be quite realistic in some ways, but you don't play between the lines. The, 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 you know, the lines are the play in that case. Um, not to say that there can't be action, but and then there's kitchen sink drama where it's, it's super real. And then there's uh, other kinds of uh, realism. So you, you want to understand the style of what you're in and not deviate from it. So it's an educational journey. Yeah, and like she would talk about doing Shakespeare, she'd say to some boy, who, who, a young man who, who did a thing from Shakespeare, and she was very respectful in a way, up to a point. But um, she would say to this guy who had talent as an actor, but he hadn't thought about what what kind of person he was playing at all, or the nature of the text that he was saying. And she sort of searched around for some way to, to say stuff to him that wouldn't actually kill him, although sometimes she didn't mind killing people. She said, um, darling, darling, Hamlet isn't a guy like you. <laughs> You've summed it up very nicely right there. <laughs> and this is, this, is so, this is so exactly how she was. <laughs> Hamlet is not a guy like you. It's just so great. And, uh, and you know, then, but then she would kindly say, look, darling, first of all, it's like th 375 years ago. Words meant different things and had different values. You must look them up, you know. <laughs> and uh, the and what what mattered to him? He's a prince. He's a prince. He doesn't have any minutiae in his life. It's done by others. He lives on a larger plane. He thinks on a higher plane. He thinks about big things. He thinks with all the power of his education. He's very intelligent. He's very, regardless of his education, intelligence has nothing to do with education or how instructed your character is. Is your character smart or dumb? It has nothing to do with his schooling. Then, you know, so Hamlet is not only very smart, he is very educated. So with all the power of his education, he thinks philosophically about the world and about life, and he speaks that way. So this is up, this is up, way up, out there. And when he's 
talking to himself, he has a partner. He has himself. She said, you always have a partner. You're talking to the audience sometimes. You're talking to yourself. You're talking to, you know, some memory. Are you so, talking to some as you're talking to some different aspect of well, yourself? Well, you have to find a partner of some kind. You can't just be talking. Hmm. You have to have some, you know, are you talking to work something out for yourself? Are you listening to it? If I do this, then I'll do that. Why would I do why would anybody do that? That's crazy. You know, you so you're reasoning. But then you might still have a direction you'd look, you'd see yourself in the mirror. That's crazy. So you you have to have you have to have something that you're Seeing and focusing on just as I am now with you. I mean, I'm not just sort of, I can, I can look off like this, but it's because I'm trying to capture some thought from the air, which of course you are doing as well, often in life. But um, I remember once an actress was doing a scene where she had this undirected monologue that she did, and I forget who she was, some you know, queen who was going to be beheaded or something. And there was a candle in the room. And it was a dark room. And Stella said, talk to the candle. You have, you've, you've got to have company. You have to have a companion. You have to have a partner. And some monologues, as you know, in, in Shakespeare are, are, um, not, are not monologues, soliloquies, are in fact to the audience quite specifically. Why would I do that? You know, generally to the crowd. So you have to think about those things. And you, so, the, so I, I think about all of those things. I prepare quite diligently. If I have to know something specific, God forbid you have an accent, you, you should go absolutely to a, um, a person who is a qualified and respected dialogue person to get help, which I have done. Get guidelines. Don't just try it yourself. At what point do you want to know the lines backwards and forwards? Do you want to? It depends. I mean, if it's a play that the lines are not going to change, you can do that really pretty early. And, and you can do that by not by locking in a performance, but by using any number of uh, you know, memory tricks. You can, write, you can write it all out. You can, you can print it all out. You can uh, uh, um, say it and read it in different accents, as I said. You can, approach it from all different, you could draw, make drawings of things, like sometimes making a transition from one, oh, I'll forget like this one thing, but it jumps from this thought to that thought, and for some reason I don't make the link, and if I haven't figured out in terms of playing, what would be making the link, what's the character, I might just do a drawing, like a, I'll draw a bird, if it's gonna say something about flying or in the next paragraph. See, I might make some sort of symbol. So you use various, kinds of tricks. You might record the cues, uh, leaving a, a proper amount of space for you to say the line. But don't, this, it's very hard uh, to do it this way, but you don't want to be acting or, say, or saying it with much feeling when you're running lines. You want to maybe say them thoughtfully and clearly with an understanding. Uh, and so the cueing, cueing is good. I learned, uh, I've learned some of the bigger parts I've learned by being cued, because then I have the pressure and then my mind can run, then I, then I have other, but I would definitely use memory tricks to, to memorize it, not, not try to burden it with a performance early on. And you, you know, you do want to know, well, if it's a newer, if it's a play that's being rewritten, you don't want to get too religious about learning it, because you, Got to be able to change it. And you also could, should think about, there's another thing that Stella would talk about, was extending the line. Sometimes if something is like a lot of short lines, you might think, well, what, what more fully would you say if you were going to go on? What, what else would you say? You want to just have a, you know, have a lot of it. Have a sense of the continuity of the yeah. character. Yeah, and she said, and look at the script a lot and think about it and try to think of questions. That's this is why her, her, her uh, the book's about the plays is very good because she asks the kinds of questions that you want to have, have in your mind to ask. Well, before we get back into sort of the uh, chronology of your career and, and TV and film, you're, you're an actor who's really been at home in both comedy and drama. Yes, I think you, I am. Yeah, and uh, it's remarkable. Because they're based on reality, both of them. Well, I wanted you to talk a little further about yeah. that. 
Well, I think it's terribly funny. I mean, theoretically, comedy is a situation that is inherently funny. And so if you play it very truthfully, the character doesn't want to be funny. You know, the character wants what the character wants. So you have to, you know, play very sincerely, you know, wh what, you, what you want. And uh, if you're frustrated in that, it gets even funnier and funnier. You can't. So you, you tr a truthfulness is always, is always going to add to a comedy element. Uh, but that, of course, depends on the writing being very good. And, that, and just timing it some, sometimes innate, and also knowing, knowing I have a real sense of I see, I can see the stage when I'm acting. So I know what might be funny and appearing or disappearing and stuff like that. That's just something from being on stage a lot. Um, what else, what else is it? So the truthfulness is the, is the key and the importance. In a comedy, you're, what you want and what you're doing has to be as important as if you're in a serious drama. So, so the situation really can become ludicrous, particularly farces where you, you know, you've got to get out before the husband gets in. You, you, you've got to. You have got to. You know, it's a matter of life and death. So you would go out windows and under beds, and you know, it becomes desperate because it's so important, because it's so real. Do you think about timing differently? Well, I think timing is an innate thing where you push the envelope of what the audience is waiting to see. I, I'm told that I have very good timing, and I don't know what it but is. But you have to be told it. You don't, don't create it. I don't, know, I don't know that I could tell somebody how to do something. I could tell somebody what good timing was. I'd say, say it now. You know, I, I know when it was, but that doesn't mean that I could tell them how to know themselves. Were there any kinds of models that you thought about, like Catherine Hepburn or people when you got more involved with TV and film? Were there, were there people whose careers or whose way of approaching roles really um, I think I admired actors. I mean, Catherine Hepburn was the one when I was younger I admired. I used to imitate her crazily. And I loved Anne Bancroft, who was in the first play that I was in. But I, I had loved her before that. I, she was, that was sort of at the height of her career. And I suppose I did imitate them. In fact, my friend Catherine Fu told me that I was imitating Anne when I did a certain scene. And I was highly offended until I realized that she was exactly <laughs> correct. And I'd, I had worked very hard on copying Anne exactly. And I said, oh, OK, you know, she said, but you should do it your own way. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's natural, too. But in terms of the way of working, um, I, I don't think I, because you don't know how people work, so I don't, I just have found my own way. And the fact is, is that there is no right way. There are things that Stella taught me that certainly help, and there are insights that, that anybody can say to you that might just strike a bell with you. Um, <laughs> I mean, there are funny things that, that really rang a bell with me and it gave me a certain freedom on stage, like, like uh, Stella would, talk about things that she referred to as tips. She, I'll give you a tip. You know, she was a, she'd been acting since she was six, so she didn't have some, she had a very exalted idea of the theater, but of the acting work itself, she, she, was, she was very practical. And she said, that she, she would talk in a practical way about the psychological difficulties that we all have with acting, like she would talk about being self-conscious. She, everybody is self-conscious. Actors are nervous. Actors are frightened. They're shy. They're how you can. Am I good? You like me? You know. So she would say, in order to deal with the the uh, discomfort of that moment that, that you are off stage, not seen, and then you will have to be on stage playing the part. She said that's that's a difficult moment sometimes. And what is that moment? And at what moment is it that you're starting to act? And what moment is, is it that you've left being yourself? And she'd say one way to sort of ride through that is to have do what she would call a covered entrance. That is, as you're, as you're coming in, you're taking off your coat. So you know the whole entrance is covered by the fact that you actually are doing something. And then you're, you're on. And you just get, you know, you're on and you're acting and, and everything's fine. And you didn't really even notice that moment, and you don't know when it was, and it doesn't matter when it was, because it was covered by an action. So 
covered entrances are good, like dropping. I think Peter Falk was covering his entire performance. <laughs> <laughs> With that raincoat. Yes, yes, no, but constantly dropping something and picking it up and moving and shuffling. And, and so that, you know, you never could get caught acting. And so, but covered entrances, uh, Stella was speaking exactly to a difficulty that we have, which is that entrance can sometimes be intimidating. And I got to the point where I just enjoyed them because I was enjoying the, 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 I was enjoying the tip and I was covering it. And sometimes I'd cover it with a lot of complex activities, you know, which amused me. So you were having a thriving career in theater. Not and really thriving. I mean, I was well, very, I, no, I was always too young chronologically for the parts that I was right for when I was a young woman because hmm. I was not an ingenue. And uh, I've had any number of instances where I was up for a part and it was on the big Broadway show that Hal Prince was doing. And I had several callbacks to that. I was so nervous. I mean, if you've been, I, I've been sometimes so frightened at auditions. It's, it's really been paralyzing. And I remember I did this audition for him that, and I had to come back for it. And he said, you know, he said, you'd be so great in this role. He just said, we just all have to acknowledge that you're really about 15 years too young, 20 years too young, and it, you'll, you'll not look right opposite the guy who's going to would be playing what would be your husband, and we just can't use you. Did you suggest you recast the husband? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, but I was actually just so grateful that he said that. It's but, such a sweet compliment. Yeah, it's a, and, and it was really... It was, you know, I've, I've taken that to heart a lot. I thought, well, it's true. I, and then as I grew into uh, those parts, I had a period where I would get very good parts. And now I play a, a lot of parts that are younger than, uh, than what I am rather than the other way around. So you takes what you get. And people say, I had an interview not long ago where somebody said, you've had such a really interesting and checkered career. How have you decided? What has made you? And I think I had mostly gotten every job I uh, uh, done every job I've been offered. I mean, it's not like I've made such clever choices. I haven't gotten some of the really jobs that I really desperately wanted I did not get. And I've done a lot of schlock jobs just to make uh, my living. So it's not been artful choosing. So talk mm -hmm. about making the transition. Tell us a little bit about, you, you had some very small parts to, be, to begin with in, the, in film and yeah. TV. Was Bosom Buddies really your, yeah, that your was, big break? But, but then it was curious, and I wish somebody from my agency was here. I would have to have this conversation with them again. I had actually a bunch of good movie parts in a row, significant, in a row, significant supporting parts. And I don't know why they haven't been able to build that into something more. It really actually is very annoying, because mm. I did very well in all of those. Yeah. Other things. I mean, things like Romancing the Stone and George of the Jungle and, and Legally Blonde. And Jewel of the Nile, you and were brought back Nile, for. Obviously. It's like, you know, I was good in those things. Is there some reason why I haven't been, you know, up to the next level? So that's, that's sort of been annoying. I have to speak to them again about that. <laughs> well, well, you I'm were totally in... totally serious. Well, you were in 19 episodes with Tom Hanks as uh, Ruth well, Dunbar. Yeah, Rosa but that Mays. was before all those movies. That yes. was before all those movies. Yes, but yeah. so we're going to, how did that come about? How did you get uh, I was actually offered that job by somebody who knew my work. Uh, A casting and, director? Uh, no, no, one of the producers of the oh. show. And uh, he was right. It worked out very well. In fact, that was my first job out here, and I thought it was insane out here. I, th I, I mean, I literally felt I was in some kind of strange dream, and such that we filmed that, we filmed that at Paramount. I mean, I was 37, 36, 37 years old. I had worked a great deal in the theater. I lived in New York, and I thought, these people are nuts. And, <laughs> and the whole process- And now you know it. The whole process of rehearsing for, for you know, a, a three-camera sitcom on tape, and and the run-throughs and the everything and everybody's attitude and things people thought and the suits coming in and everybody's reaction to that and all of this stuff happening. And there was a nervous wreck. And I remember I asked somebody from my agency to come have lunch with me every day. And at lunch I would say something, this happened this morning. And yesterday afternoon what happened was that. And so then this morning I couldn't believe it, but these guys came in and they said, that's that. And I told the whole thing, I said, so that's crazy, right? Isn't that crazy? And she'd say, yes. I'd say, oh, it is? And she'd say, yes. I said, so it is crazy. So it is all crazy. She said, yeah. 
<laughs> so this is the norm. Yeah. But the, but the pay was better than okay. off Broadway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not much, though. I, as old as I was, they started to be like a newbie, you know. Uh, so just well, how many jobs you've had, you know, sort of quote. And but that was a great experience, and Tom was. And every, did you look at him and say, "Here's, yes. here's yeah. the guy who's going to be yeah. number I, one box office." Yeah. Star well, I was not a kid, my, and I, I, no, I didn't know he was going to be number one box office. I just said, "But you knew he had something." He's going to have a, no. I knew he was going to have a great career. Yeah. yeah. I knew there was absolutely nothing he could do, and he was also a very interesting person, and and extremely adaptable and easygoing with people. A natural leader, but in a very easygoing way, and no, there was, there was really, there was really no question in my mind. And my mother would come up to visit at one point, just adored him, and really just was crazy about him. And I, I can't believe, I don't know quite how it happened, that she asked for or wanted a picture of him. You know, he's eight by, six. and I, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know how this came about, but it's like. I mean, what, what did, you know, it seems so unlike her. I mean, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> and so he wrote, on, he wrote on it, you know, I guess to Virginia. He said, I love you madly. And then signed it, Tommy. On her wall. <laughs> on her wall. Yeah. And you went back to work for him and with him in, uh, in Electric City. I did. Well, we've known him. He's a very loyal guy. When, if once you're friends with Tom, you stay friends with Tom. And he's, as I'm sure you've heard, he's a big letter writer. He loves his typewriters. He has a big collection of typewriters, including a, a, an aubergine colored one from me. And he carries them with him, and he, and he writes letters to people, lots of them. And so he's always kept in touch that way. Now we email, but not, not sometimes he'll send a like for your birthday, you'll get a typewritten letter. And uh, we, we've worked together a couple of times, and we were on Broadway at the same time last year, and, we, and he, did, he did see our show because he was, they were a little after us, so he did come to see the dress rehearsal of our show, and then he was in previews the next night and couldn't see us, so he was great. And uh, after Bosom Buddies, uh, you worked for Norman Lear. Well, well, that was sometime after. Norman Lear, you know, you hear stories about these show writers that are all monsters. Well, a lot of and them And you've are. met a few. I I've, I've met a few, and, and it's a horrible, difficult job, and they sometimes do become monsters with power and with pressure. But Norman Lear was just godlike, and it was an amazing experience to work for him. Just amazing. He did a show called Powers That Be. With John Forsyth. With John Forsyth and Eve Gordon and Robin Bartlett and Elizabeth Barrage and Peter Nichols and David Hyde Pierce. It was, it was, a, it was a political satire. And uh, John Forsyth played a senator called Senator Powers, uh, who, whose wife wanted him to run for president. It was called Powers That Be. That's typical of Norman to come up with a title like that. So that Sounds like something that would never work today. Yeah. Oh, well. It, we, it, no, I'm kidding, of yeah, course, exactly. with Netflix and, exactly. uh, and it would, of, Well, it would uh, really work cards. today. I mean, the thing is, the network had no idea yeah. what they had on their hands. And, you know, we limped through a second season, and we, we lost some of the important writers. And it was just never, the show never had real support. And I remember one time we were working on the scene, and Norman had directed the Pilot and a few other, but he, but then he was not on the floor much. So he was on the floor one day, and we're back bursting on this scene, and I could see him over there, and I kept seeing Norman just sort of standing there. I finally stopped rehearsing. I said, Norman, you need something, and he said, I just like watching you work. Mm -hmm. Oh, he was. Just, I just loved him. I loved him so much. I remember one time I was after that show was over, like a couple of years later, I was in that building on. Sunset and Gower, and um, where his offices were, and he had this writing room where you could find him if he wasn't in his office. He was in the writing room, and I saw, I, as I looked around, I saw him in that room with about, you know, 20 people, and they weren't yet settled, and they were talking. The door was open, and there were sort of food containers around. I get, I got this idea in a flash, and I just was doing it before I even thought about it, <laughs> and I ran into the room, up to him, and I said. And I'm starting to take off my clothes. And I'm taking my shoes. I said, I'm so sorry, I'm late. 
oh my God, it was hell getting here. The traffic was just unbelievable. And I think somebody knows, you know, people are finding out about this. <laughs> and, so and then I said, and I'm talking, and then I suddenly look and I see the others and, oh my God, I, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm, ter I'm terribly sorry, you know. <laughs> anyway, he was on the floor. <laughs> he's, su he's such a wonderful. He's such a. He's such a wonderful guy. So that show did not did not succeed, and uh, I was in a number of very good. Bosom Buddies did not succeed. It's still running from the picture. It's still running, <coughs> but in its day, it did not succeed. I mean, I get you know residual checks for eleven cents, <laughs> but um, but it did not succeed in the same. The powers that be did not run again, and I, I mean, it's on YouTube. You can see it. There's some very funny things in it. But uh, I was working with John Forsythe. Oh, that. Well, odd, odd. But let me just say, finish about how we we got we got canceled. We never, we. I mean, Norman read about it in the trades. He'd never heard, and I was in his office. This man had won every Peabody's and. You know, he's a huge, important man. This man owns a contemporary copy of the Bill of Rights, mm. which he paid over a million dollars for years ago, and which he travels to schools all over the country. This is a very big person. He and revolutionized television. Yeah, American he television. absolutely did. And he didn't, they, you know, he, and I, I'm in his office, and I'm fulminating like this, and I'm swiveling around in his office, and I'm yelling and screaming, and, he, and he's standing there, and he takes my face in his hands like this, and he says, Holland. Holland. You know, he said, what kind of a schmuck would I have to be to take it personally? And let me tell you, guys, almost nothing is personal that will happen to you in this, your entire career. Almost nothing is personal. That's a great piece of wisdom and yeah. advice, I think. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's kin to you can't get a job. It's, it's not, you know, it's just the machinery. There's so many things that work. And it, and luck is a very big part of it. But your looseness and your presence and your aliveness is a big part of it, too. But so you started John Forsythe. Oh, John Forsythe. Who's an interesting this, actor. He was Hitchcock a nice man. He was just a stiff, he was just a stiff actor. Hitchcock he used it well, with. though, that, his stiffness, I think. Well. <laughs> He wouldn't go with the group. No, it was hard in a Norman Lear thing, in the kind of acting where he, he was not. Uh, he was quite. He, a, he was kind of a little bit older too at yeah. that point, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Yes, he was. They gave him a nice young wife. I he guess. was oddly proper. I mean, he was a little bit too proper. He couldn't play certain things very well. Although a senator, you would think would be might might come in handy to be, like John Warner or like one yeah. of those guys. Yeah. He's kind of a bit stiff. Yeah, well, he, like you know, he was wonderful actually in the part in terms of its outward manner. But as a human being, you mean? As he, an acting he just partner. was. He just was. Yeah, he was very reserved. That's important, isn't it? What the other actor is giving you? It's really key. Well, I think the most important thing is that you know they be who they are, and if they, if there's any sort of interference or aggression, or that's that can be very, very difficult. Um, it can be very, it can, I mean, people can be very upset when they have a conflict of some kind with a fellow actor in the work. And I, I really don't know what to say about that. It's just try to communicate and try to be fair and open about it. But it's, it's very... Not ignore it, in other words. Not ignore it, but just say, what can we do? And, and um, as far as pranks and stuff on stage, I mean, I won't tolerate any of it. You know, I just... It's, it's, but there are difficulties. But about Meryl Streep, I mean, I, I heard Mike Nichols say about Meryl that, that she tends to have the relationship with the actor that is the correct relationship that is in the movie or in the play. So if the relationship is frosty, she's likely not to get very friendly with the person. And it, it would be very hard for the actor. I would hate to be in that position with her because I think she's <laughs> so wonderful. Uh, actually, she has been very wonderful to me any number of times. Uh, and we've just met very, very superficially. But boy, I wish I had it with me. I swear to God, I'd read it to you. Actually, I wouldn't because it's, it would be for the archives. I, I, I got some wonderful letters when I was doing Anne, and really extraordinary letters from peers and colleagues. Anne Richards, your one, doing the, one doing woman the play. show. Yeah. yeah. And Meryl came to that play 
And the night she came was just so unbelievable because she came with and was seated next to Bill Clinton, mm. Hillary Clinton, Gabby Giffords, mm. and Mark Kelly, and Merrill. <laughs> now, I didn't, I didn't know they were out there. I never knew that anyone was out there. I told, I told my, my producer on the ground, I said, don't ever let me know. I, I, it's very hard to concentrate. And we had stellar people at this every night. And, but that was really something. And Meryl was so wonderful to me. We had this sort of long reception afterwards and lots of pictures of it. And I look at these pictures and I still doesn't seem like me. Of course, I don't really look like me in those pictures because I've all in the Ann Richards get up. But there's a picture with her holding my forearms or holding each other's arms like this in profile. And she's like, <gasps> like, like she's saying, I can't believe it, which is pretty much what she was saying, you know, just. And I'm just smiling and like beatifically, like, I can't believe you're saying this shit. It's just, <laughs> it, was just so, it was just so unbelievable. But anyway, she writes the producer, who's an old friend of hers, Bob Boyette, and a neighbor in Connecticut. She writes, don't tell her this. If you, if you, if you. We won't write, breathe the word. She writes him a letter, because they're, they're neighbors in Connecticut. And she, she compliments him on the production. And he said, um, and she said, wonderful stuff about, and what a character, crystal and character hall. And she, I mean, a long email that long about mm. my spouse, you know, and, and, and the work. Can you imagine? I was like, uh, my eyes are out on stalks. So I, I cannot tell you how many times. <coughs> but I got lots of good letters from that. Well, let's, uh, let's jump forward to talk about Anne as long yeah. as we're talking about yeah. it. This is something you wrote. I it was did. a passion project. I did. You created it, you I developed did. it. I tell, us, I know. tell us about well, what compelled you, you know, on this uh, journey. Oh, you, have a, you have a program. Can I, can I look at that? This is, the, this is the program for it, if you can see this. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Thank and you were nominated for a Tony. I was nominated for a Tony, which was amazing. And I won the Outer Circle Critics uh, Solo Performance Award. But um, I've puzzled how I could talk about this because it is a special situation. Has, did anybody here see it? Did, where'd you get that program? I was, I was one of your ambassadors. Oh, great. But you didn't come to the show? I, I what did, can I, I did, say? I did not get to the show. But I was, I, and, and we chatted online, and, and I hoped that it would become a teleplay or something. Well, you, you know. You always said it, that it was always meant for on stage, it's 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 a play, and right. it couldn't be a movie, but it could be filmed as a play right, if you right. really filmed it. Not like you were trying to make a picture like a movie, but that you were getting really get in and all around it to show that it's a play. And I had an idea how to do that. But PBS asked to do it the last week we were doing it at Lincoln Center, and the guy who runs PBS, the CEO, called me. He called me at home, and uh, said we want to get it, you know. And I said, well. It's too late. I mean, I, and he was a he's a businessman, and he he had no idea what how complex an issue it would be to film something in, in Lincoln Center, which is 180 degrees. It's a huge theater. You can't just do that. And um, there was a possibility of doing it, and there still is a doing it in the Amundsen. And now, yeah. but it was filmed there. archivally. Oh yes, and said. it was filmed. And and I haven't seen that, but I think it would be like it was like a single camera, but it was very artfully done because they. They, they saw the play several times. They made notes. They worked with the director. They, you know, they filmed it very, very carefully. I think they filmed two films. And where is it? Are, where, it's who? at the New York Public, it's at the New York Theater of the Performing Arts, which is in the Lincoln Center complex, which is right and next. Presumably theater students and scholars yes. can go in and watch uh, You might it. have to get permission, in which case um, I, you know, if you would get to me via this organization, I would give anyone permission. That, but I think that first they have it more tight because they they're protecting the intellectual property. I mean, I really did I did some very I think brilliant things that were like ideas that visited me from the heavens about how to do a one person show that were very exciting. Now talk about the writing of it. How did you decide well, that you would write it? First of all, I'll tell you. I'll try to be brief about it because it's such a big thing. I don't want to go on over long about it. But there are two things that I would love people to take away from it. First of all, from, from my talking about it now, 
first of all, for your information, it was not uh, something that I did to do a one-person show for myself. I did not have this idea I wanted to do a one-person show. You know, I'm 100 years old. I, 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 I thought about doing one-person shows, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So, and so it, what didn't come from that, I wasn't casting about for a character to play in a one-person show. And I wasn't thinking about writing one either. I mean, I, in fact, do write well. I like writing, but I, I, had, no, I, I had no thought to do had that. Had you been I, produced before as a writer or anything? No, no. No. I mean, when I say I like writing, I mean, I like writing letters. I'm a good, I'm a, I like the language. I like writing. I like reading, you know. And I'm not a dummy about it. But uh, what happened was Ann Richards died. And I had met her once, but that's not, that has nothing to do with it. For, for those who don't know, she is Democratic governor of Texas. Yeah, and she was extremely, well, actually, there's a documentary that came out about her that's very worth seeing because my play was about her persona because she was an extremely uplifting, engaging, captivating, thrilling character who inspired a lot of women, but also men, too. She inspired people, and she really lifted people up. This was her nature, and she lifted me up. I mean, I was really affected by her. When she died, really unexpectedly, comparatively young, 73, um, I was really just blown over. But the, the thing that was interesting was that it persisted for months. I thought, what's the matter with you? Because you, you met her once. I mean, this is ridiculous. And then I realized that I really was, I needed to do something creative about her. And I thought, well, what? And I thought, well, I, you know, I, I suppose I could act her with a lot of work. I mean, the, I knew enough about her life to know that the period between when she quit drinking and won the election as governor, which was an impossible win. It was completely impossible. In fact, I, I, I still can't believe it happened in a way. Yeah, even Post though, Johnson, even though I Democrats know the, just don't win. All the in details, that part of the world. right. I mean, it's just not possible. And a woman? I mean, please. But uh, in any case, I, I had to do something so I would think, well, it would be a movie of the week about that last 10 years. And, and I, and I, I know people. You know, I know Norman. I know Tom Hanks. I know George Clooney. Well, I, I, I can sit. These guys produce. Uh, they would be. They were crazy about her. Uh, and I never did anything about. One day I'm driving to Two and a Half Men, and I suddenly, and I'm berating myself. Why didn't? Why haven't you done anything? So pay attention if you're berating yourself about anything. And, and I suddenly realized, because it isn't a movie of the week. It isn't a film. It isn't television. It's theater. This was a live wire. This is a person who talked directly to audiences, gave thousands of speeches, was a was you know a great campaigner, was a politician, was flesh was pressing of flesh, captivating an audience, lifting up, and it just and I'm driving and I, I I literally pulled over on a service road going towards Bonham. I thought what what am I thinking here, and I I realized. The f like four or five operating principles of the play, which remained the governing principles of the play, I thought of in the next 15 minutes. A, the whole thing is a the mise en scène is it's a graduation speech, which allows her to be anecdotal but also go anywhere in time. Because it's like the way children play. You can walk over here and say, when I'm over here, I'm a cowboy. When I'm over here, I'm an Indian. <laughs> so that's the first thing I thought. Then I thought, she's dead. I mean, she's, this is a visitation. We don't say that up front, but they discover that at the end. So she's giving a graduation speech. There's a whole centerpiece, where, which is the, the, the centerpiece of the play, which takes place in the governor's office, this beautiful set that we made, where she takes and makes you know, 30 phone calls and has conversations with her secretary, who's just off stage in a very realistic sort of doorway that goes through her office. Uh, 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 just a bunch of and other ideas, but the principal one is that she, uh, the graduation th thing in the office, and that she is dead. And at the end of the play, she's talking about and does this great speech that she wrote, which I had to write, which was the speech she never gave. So at the end of this speech, which is really a drum thumper, um, she, the, there's a lighting effect and she turns into the darkness and comes out of the light and she's confused for a moment where she is and then she sees the audience and she's guessed. 
I never do get to give that speech. And that's how they find out that she's dead. And then there's another oh, a wind up that's quite affecting. I mean, it, it was really, so that's 15 minutes, and I never look back. So this is something that if it happens to you, it's like getting hit by lightning. Don't, uh, if, it, if you get hit like that, you're gonna do it. And the thing is, I have to say that nothing dissuaded me. I would get depressed in stages. I mean, this is a thing that went on for six, seven years, where we are, the, last, the only time I really got despondent was when we had, we had played the Kennedy Center. The Beaumont, the biggest, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Eisenhower, the big theater there, and had been a huge success. I mean, the last week, you couldn't get a ticket. It didn't matter who you were. You'd be a senator, you couldn't get it. There were no tickets. So, and then we couldn't get, we thought we had a New York theater, and then we didn't have it, as it turned out. And we went for a month where it looked like, shit, what if we don't actually get a theater? And then, then people would say, yeah, well, lots of plays don't. I said, well, what happens? And they say, they don't get on. They don't ever happen. I said, you mean, the, you mean they raise the whatever, however much money the play takes? To, yeah. And they don't get a theater? Yeah. Maybe they'll get a theater in you know, a couple of seasons down the line. By that time, it's not timely and it doesn't work. And, I mean, there's only whatever there are. There's only, what, you know, 30 there's only a certain number of theaters. And, uh, then we did get quite a theater. We got Lincoln Center, but and you did over a hundred performances there. One hundred and fifty-one, <laughs> eight a week. And I love the fact that uh, Alan. Thank you for reminding. And uh, Alan uh, Cummings, who who was playing his Macbeth show, which is a one-act play, not as long, and um, he said he's like twenty-five years younger than I am. <laughs> And he said, I, I couldn't possibly do it. It'd kill me. I live like a nun as it is. Doing, you know, doing six a week is, pfft, that's all I can do. And Fiona Shaw said the same thing. And there I am doing eight. <laughs> and it did almost kill me, though, I have to say. It did actually almost kill me. So, um, but, but the thing is, this, I was really, I was really struck by, with a motivation and a vision that, I mean, I always felt like Anne was doing it. That it seemed like outside myself. And I don't know where I got, I guess I thought, well, I am, I have been in millions of plays. I understand what makes something work, what makes a moment work. I, I write well, well, you know, I, I have done three years of research. I know everyone who was close to Anne. In some cases, I'm close to some of them. They embraced me almost like open sesame, which is amazing because for, for for four decades, everybody had wanted a piece of, of Anne. Everybody, and they were like, forget about it. For some reason, I mean, they were very protective of her because she was charm itself. I mean, imagine Bill Clinton quadruple his charm. And, and she was beautiful. I mean, she was a white-haired, wrinkled old lady, but beautiful. So much so that you just sort of couldn't, couldn't believe it. And funny. And powerful. As an and orator, a very, very a powerful orator. Oh, powerful! She could get, she could get down and dirty, and and and, and uh, I mean, the great speech that she did at the, at the convention, eighty-eight convention, is really was seeing the whole speech as a master. Silver foot. The silver foot speech, but uh, the big thing of that speech was where she talked about the people who f feel you know they've been forgotten. It's middle class. It's, it's just lost and, and no support. And she says, well, of course you feel forgotten because you have been. And she just had a way of just, she was, she was really remarkable. So I was really captivated and some of you might be captured by something in your life. Get the best advice, go to the top, which I did. I just went to the top. I had no doubts. I mean, all those Ann Richards people, open sesame. The archive, open sesame. It's not, be and it wasn't, I assure you, because I'm some, you know, woman from a sitcom or have, you know, I have that, some kind of residual Hollywood. It isn't, it wasn't that. It was because of my clarity, the work that I had done, the, my intention of how I was going to go about it, my fervor, 
And they, you know, this girl can go the distance. It'll be amazing if she does, but. People got out of your way. People got out of my way, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and she had that quality. Yeah. And it, well, I, I think that, you know, without having planned on it as such, I mean, I, I, I was equipped. I did the work. I knew what I was talking about. I, 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 her own daughter, Cecile Richards, who's head of Planned Parenthood, says, Holland knows in a general kind of over, overarching way more about my mother than I, than I do. She knows all kinds of things that I don't know anything mm -hmm. about. And of course, she, you know, I'm not sort of saying that I know her closely the way she did, but I talked to, in these phone calls, I talked to all the children and I had a theme. The one, I talked to all the children from the governor's office and the, whole, the reason why I talked to each of them was they were planning this trip to South Padre where they went a lot. And um, it was like a, uh, where the food had to be brought and what, who was going to do what. And so the conversations sort of had somewhat the same drive to them. And at the end of the very end of the play, I talked to Cecile. And each conversation with the kid is very different. And with Cecile, and of course, a lot of people in the audience knew her. And at least six or seven times, she was in the audience. And so they know who I had said to her daughter, her little my, my granddaughter I was talking to on the phone first, and I'm signing papers and I have to get out of the office and I have to finish everything that has to go out that day, so I'm doing this all at the same time. I talked to the granddaughter and I said, I do need to speak to your mama, and I'm signing papers, clearly waiting for her to come, you know, and, do it. and then I said, how are you, darling? You know, and then we've had this conversation when I say, how are you, darling? I mean, I knew Cecile was like out there, and. It, it was very weird, and there were other times in the conversation. I got very good friends with her chief of staff, Mary Beth. And early in the early in the scene, she's practically the first person I speak to, and it's sort of an anchor. I get comfortable, and and um, I'm supposed to be waiting for her to get on the line, and I said, and I'm waiting, and then, and I'm supposed to, you know, ha, you know, and I'm waiting, and I'm sort of waiting to hear. I'm supposed to say, Holland, she's not going to be there, so I would have to. I would forget that I was looking forward to Mary Beth getting on the line. It's like, it's like, you have to pretend that she is on the line. Okay! You deceived yourself. Yeah, I did. I, I, I was that good. <laughs> well, moving backwards, uh, around the time of Powers That Be, you did yeah. a movie that I love, which is uh, To Die For, with uh, yeah. Gus Van Sant. Yes, uh, he was Talk about one. working on that film. Well, with, I did Which Buck Henry wrote The Graduate. Yeah, Buck Henry did write We've become, wrote. We have become very good friends, Buck and I. We're doing a little film next weekend, in fact. Oh, really? Um, I didn't get to know Gus Van Sant at all because my part was really very little. I just was aware that he was this outlier. And he's become more of an inlier now, but at that time he was really an outlier. And he was definitely up to something uh, stylistically. But his style has changed. But he was, you know, he was an, an outlaw in a way and an outlier in those days. Yeah, I think yeah. that movie really made mainstream Hollywood kind of look it at him a little differently. It did. It was a because success. Because it was so, uh, so incredibly realized. Yeah. And yeah. you did The Truman Show. Yeah, with Peter Weir. Who was an amazing oh, artist. Was, uh, yeah. He was, uh, uh, he visionary. was, he was a visionary, is a visionary. and. He was, again, his focus, uh, if I can just say again, if ever you have something that you are passionate about, go all the way. That's what he does. That's what I did with Anne, and that's what Anne did in her life. And I think only that I was playing her could I, did I have the courage in some kind of inspired way to make such a commitment which was deeply costly to me, physically and out of my life. I mean four or five years, I had my own life and responsibilities and relationships in it were just, you know, very much sacrificed. And my health for a time was sacrificed, yeah. so it was like. But he, Peter Weir, is, he goes all the way into something, into his vision for something, which in the Truman Show, it's less easy to see than in something like Master and Commander, which is one of the great movies I've ever seen, based on, you know, that's the sailing, the, the big boat. And, and that is based on this uh, novel that is just not at all theatrical or dramatic. Yeah, it's very he really created this story 
Uh, but his knowledge of the world, of shipping and behavior of life on a ship, this is what an actor should know, so that it has that kind of grit to it, so that you know what's your, you know, what's your physical life and what your daily life is like. What do you, uh, what, are the, what is the way you like directors to work with you? How do you talk to directors? How do you get what oh, you need? Oh, it just so changes from, it so changes from job to job. I like a director who is respectful, who assumes I've done the work, who wants to see what I'm going to do with it. And a, a lot of them really just let you, a lot, a lot of them let you run. I hired a director to, not the first time out really, I hired a friend to sort of be my eyes and ears for me the first time I did it. I did this show seven times I was developing it and rewriting it and changing it. But I always had to do it in a huge theater. It was, it was not a black box. I mean, you, you, could, you could only do that play about her in an enormous theater. It wouldn't make sense in any other context. Because she's giving a graduation speech. It's big. It's splendid. The welcome that, 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 that is set up for her is tremendous. So um, what, what was my point? What was I going for? Talking about directors shit. and the one you brought on for Oh, Adam. yeah. So I, so I hired a guy who would be my eyes and ears and feedback what I was doing. And then when it was clear that we were going into have a big commercial production, I, uh, I hired um, on Jack O'Brien. I mean, I would ask, normally ask Jack to direct it, but he was booked for you know, three or four years. And he, uh, on his advice, I hired someone who had been his young assistant and who was very, very smart, but who was like 30. And uh, I, I, I knew that there would be some kinds of things that he simply wouldn't be able to give me because of his age, but I doubted very much that Jack would recommend him so highly. That, and, and maybe Jack knew that he would be respectful enough of me to, to not try and put his print on the on the thing in some kind of fundamental way to... He would serve what your intention was. Yeah, and he was. basically said that's what he was going to do to me. Mm -hmm. he, he, he basically said, uh, I am going to help make your vision flesh. You know? And he... I trusted him. In fact, I don't think he was forceful enough in commenting on what I would regard as weak things in my acting. Because I was not... This is a real reach for me. First of all, playing somebody like that and very different from me, very, very different from me, and with a, the dialect that was profoundly part of who she was. And also in this daring situation of a one-person play, it's just so unbelievable. The first 33 minutes of that play was basically, um, what do you call a setup? Uh, um, you know, setting something up. The, Prologue What's or? no but exposition. exposition? It was exactly it was expositionary, but disguised. I mean, I had a lot of action in it. I had a lot of things I was trying to do with the audience, but they needed to have a, a they they needed to have a lot of information, get out there, and and they the audience needed a lot of information in order to care about anything, or to be able to follow anything that would then come. And after the thirty three minutes, that then she I, the, took took her from the beginning of the speech into her telling the stories, into her talking about different times in her life, her, her parents, what her background was, to get her to win the governorship. And at that moment, when she, that 33 minutes, she gets to that point in New York anyway, we had a massive set that was actually on top of the platform that I was standing on to give the graduation speech with you know, the, 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 the settings from a college hall with, flags and bunting and so forth and so on, comes on top of that, sliding in on a, some kind of machinery underneath the stage of Lincoln Center that you wouldn't believe. There is an enormous area behind the stage, and the governor's office appeared from the blackness and started rolling in the whole stage, 33 feet. And I, as I'm walking across the stage, she's just coming and stepping to the side, and as it arrives, I step up on it. So, but it was 33 minutes up to that. And there were some times I thought, oh, I'm just going to die. I'm just going to slide to the floor and be dead. You know, and then you're just, you just carry on. But you had to try to shape it and to drive it. I mean, the stamina was just extraordinary. And I got better at it, which means that I wasn't good at it at different times, and I needed help. And I think he was shy of saying, 
you know you're really going too slow in that section. But, but he was great. He was remarkable. And so I want a director to be honest with me. If I trust him, if I trust his taste and his judgment, I want him to say, it's not working. We'll have to find, or that section isn't working, or you're, uh, no, uh, better than that, to be more specific than that. If, if you're being sentimental, you really want a director to say you're being sentimental. If you're being too self-important and self-involved and contemplating your own navel, you want a director to say you're contemplating your own navel. That's not what this scene is about. So uh, there are all kinds of pitfalls that you could fall into. There was a time when I was doing parts of this stuff as though I was talking to children. I don't know why. I mean, I guess it was, you know, I'm not that great. It took a while to find mm -hmm. the right way to do it. And uh, I saw it when I saw some film from it. I thought I'm talking to them like they're children. And so then I stopped. Do you like to watch yourself? Ate it <laughs> so much. <laughs> I hate it because I'm so disappointed. It's often so very different from what I thought I'd done. Like that, except that well, I could at least change it. But what, that's what I hate. I hate watching movies that I've done. It's over. It's going to be like that forever, just like that. <laughs> well, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about two of your really uh, trademark uh, uh, parts, which is on the practice. Oh, right. For which you won an Emmy. That was a great part. That was and, a very yeah, good. it's so memorable. It I was... remember hardly anything about that show today, except your part in your oh, character. Very lovely of you to say so. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It was so delicious. Yeah. It was. Well, she was, it was not really a plan of uh, David's. He needed a, I, you know, he, I, he likes having women judges be smart. So he had this woman judge, and I forget what the first scene was, but it was a good scene, and that was all I was hired to do with her, one of her young lawyers. But then, coincidentally, he saw two things. He, I think he saw a film I did for my nephew, who is Brad Anderson, called um, Next Stop Wonderland. Mm -hmm. And then he, he saw a movie I did with his wife called One Fine Day, in which I had, a little, Pfeiffer, of course. Which I had a little thing, Michelle Pfeiffer, and I had a little thing with, with George Clooney, where I was sort of flirtatious with him, but, but didn't give him any never mind you know. And, and Richelle was interested in him, and David said he thought the mother could give that guy, you know, his daughter a run for her money for that guy. Because it was, you know. And so then he, he decided, how about if this judge is, you know, sexy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, He didn't know what he was asking for, yeah, did he, quite? Well, <laughs> and I, and so I did, I don't know how many I did all in all. Do you know, 20 or something? I, don't I know. think 21. 20 years. And, there, I got to do some sexy stuff for the day, for that period. It was period. unbelievable, really. Yeah. It, 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 it shocked people, I think, to some extent. Well, I mean, I had one script, and I didn't get to say the actual word, but I remember getting the script, and I got home really late one night, like at 2 or 3 in the morning, and I eagerly would read, you know, the script that I was doing, and I read this scene between me and this guy I'd had this affair with who was... Uh, who was threatening me in a lawsuit, I guess it was. And he'd been one of my clerks or something, and I had, I had an affair with him. And I turned the page, and I read what I was going to say on national television. I went like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I have to call somebody. I have to call somebody. And I thought of my girlfriends and who I would call. And then I, it, was, it was 3 in the morning. And I thought, I, I'm, I'm calling Suzanne Burnish in England. <laughs> and, I, and I called a girlfriend in London because she was up because it was, you know, like... It was day there. It was day there. Uh, it was like early in the morning. I said, Suzanne, Suzanne, listen to this. Listen to this. Uh, you know, I read it to her. And the, the line w that I was going to say, which I ended up not being able to say, was I, I gave him the greatest blow job in the history of mankind. <laughs> and they changed it to fellatio. But I still, people think that was so, I think, oh, please. Pretty, but, much, pretty much the same thing. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I didn't As I understood it. But, but, the, but the guy, but then they had me have a relationship with Jimmy, 
who was sort of a, who was not my idea of a sexy cohort. And I thought, well, that's. It's called acting. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, I did. But then Jim, you know, he was this younger guy, and then he would, you know, he, then it would, it would break up and it would hurt me. And, you know, I got to play some very interesting things. And I, it's funny because I was actually going through a very messy breakup at the time, and I was so irresponsible to that part because I was, my mind was dominated by other things, and I, I didn't give it anywhere near the attention that I should have. I would have been better. Um, well, you were good enough to win Emmy. Life, yeah. Well, that was probably the shock value as much as anything else. Oh, well, it was, a, it was a really memorable portrait. Let's talk just a little bit about um, Two and a Half Men. That yeah, about. that was, thank you. Well, that was, an, that was an audition, that was a meeting audition, and I think I did read a little bit of it. I mean, sometimes, sometimes um, when a meeting is really easygoing, they obviously sort of are very interested in you. I mean, you could just say, well, why don't we read a little bit of this? Because I actually, I didn't care whether I got that job or not. I mean, I didn't care. It wasn't a huge, I didn't have an attachment to it getting it the way I might, uh, some, a role of theater, you know, that had more depth to it. This was a sitcom, and I've done a lot of sitcoms. And my mother had just died, and I really didn't know, I was just like so upside down. I suddenly, I think I suddenly felt, I think this happens sometimes, I suddenly felt elderly, you know, and I wasn't, but I, my mother had died, and it was, I felt so strange, so I didn't know where the hell I was. So sometimes when you're really like that, you, you give a good audition because you don't have anything invested in it. I'll tell you when you're really going to give a great audition, when you got to go catch, get a plane to, 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 to Paris, you know, to Paris, to meet the love of your, to meet your lover. You know, you are so not going to care. <laughs> that nonchalance is very interesting. You want, you want to do it, you want to do it well, but let's do it quickly because I've got to go. Do it well and do it quickly. That's very good advice for any actor. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course you were there when all the controversy was going on. I know it's not something you like to talk about much, but we Well, I love this. Charlie. I, I mean, Charlie and I hit it off from the minute we started. He makes the work look easy, which it ain't, which you all know it ain't. And he's very, very gifted. He got very bored um, in, you know, doing the same thing. And the, the style of that show is very superficial style. It's just standing there and saying the lines with the right intent, and that, that's going to get very tiring for a guy if he's got to carry the weight and come up and down those stairs. I don't mean the effort, I mean it's always the same. I mean, he's let's an face underrated it, actor. He's right? very yeah. underrated as an actor, and, and he, you know, he was clean and sober all that time until about three weeks before that crash, and uh, he did crash, and he was using it to such an extent. Every day I thought he was gonna, I was going to hear on the news that he was dead. So I'm very glad that he's uh, he's okay. I mean, he's not dead, but he's I know he's pretty wild and woolly, and I I love him. I've always loved him. But there was a lot of unpleasantness, and I wasn't around. I was on very little by then, because I didn't read about 38 episodes. I don't know how many I've done all told, but I first of all I wasn't on I wasn't on every episode. I was on just some of them and. Uh, when they wanted to extend everybody's contract, that everybody went, but I, I said no, because by then I already had um, turned my attention to Anne, and I, I said, look, I'm going to do this play. I have to be free for it. I'd be happy to visit if I'm available, if you want me, but I'm not going to be under contract. And they were, um, I think, very surprised, because people don't usually do that. And I think they were maybe a little pissed off. I didn't. I don't think I was on the next year much, but they have me. And I think I'm doing one in a couple of weeks. This is the last season. What um, you know, you've been on shows that have worked and shows that haven't yeah. worked. Uh, have you uh, have you had any observations about that? Why this show and you know not some other show? I don't know. I really don't. I mean, Charlie's charm was amazing. The show is, has always been raunchy. Has always pushed the envelope has been, you know, downright dirty sometimes. Um, and I guess the themes, you know, the mother hating and the women debasing <laughs> seem to appeal to the general. They never, they, never, 
They never get tired. So I don't know. <laughs> I, ha I have to say one thing on that show, refer to one thing on that show that I won't repeat here because it's too appalling. But and it was on national television. Yeah, and when I said it, I thought, I, uh, nobody's objecting to this? I mean, I just couldn't. It was so wrong. I just couldn't believe it. It was just so wrong. We'll have I've to never, watch it on YouTube. I didn't, I didn't see it on the air because oh, I, I, I don't see my, many of the episodes. Do you often ask for changes in, in the script? On Not on where, that show. Not on that show. <laughs> <laughs> no. In fact, some shows are so controlled by the writers, uh, like Norman Lear's wasn't. Man, if you came up with a good ad lib, it went right in. And he would fall over and he'd say, that's just so brilliant. I mean, uh, but uh, if you come up, if you, you don't even come up with an idea on Two and a Half Men. It's just not that atmosphere. They, 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 I think, the, the, first of all, let's say it, the writing is brilliant. I mean, those first years, it's, you know, episode after episode, we'd open it, we'd laugh all the way through it. The writing is incredibly skilled. Uh, Chuck Lorre is a great storyteller. And you know, weaving the A story with the B story, so they sort of come out at the same time. It's, and they would do it on their feet. They would come up with solution, solutions on their feet. You just couldn't believe. But um, they imagine it very fully in the writers' room. So they're waiting to hear you do exactly what they've imagined. That sometimes that in an audition as well, you have to really would have to really hit them with something that really worked. That was completely different to jar them from what they were expecting. So I, they don't want to hear if you say. This is what if I, it's like their ears go shut, you know. No, you, so that, it's very rigid, so no, there's not much, not much playfulness there. So that's maybe not quite as much fun as when you feel no, that I your don't think, ideas I don't, are... No, I don't think it, I don't think it is. And we, it's fun, we had some fun when things were physical. John, John Cryer was so great at physical comedy, and so was Charlie, and some things uh, were fun to do because they were just so inherently funny. and. And they worked out well, but uh, I think when the when the show is so writer driven, to the exclusion of other input, it's hard. It's actually hard on everybody. It's got to be tough on directors too, a little bit. Very in much situations. so. Oh, very much so. I know it was. Yeah, but they've had the same director for a long time, and it, it, it it's I I do them periodically. They go very well. Very smooth. So. And it's it's magic. The things that work well are, are generally in show business are sort of magic. There's just no way of knowing. Things that sound on paper like this is going to be the greatest show ever in the world just lies. <laughs> just lies. Yeah. And how has the success of that affected uh, your choices and, and, and your career? Has it much? Or you, where, do you, where do you see yourself well, at this point? The horrible thing about acting is that you can only do one thing at a time. The most... Uh, Unfortunate aspect, I think. It's all, it's just so sad. It's, it's a very big problem for actors in America. It's the three thousand miles, because you, you can't do theater, New York theater, and you can't do Hollywood stuff unless you're a very big star and very wealthy to easily go back and forth. And people have very strangulated careers. You get on a series that holds you for eleven. Now, of course, they have. Lots of the cable shows are short, you know, 10 weeks and stuff. It's not quite as daunting. But you're held. You can't, you, you can't act two places in one time. You can't do it. And it's so your life goes by. And I, this series, the great redeeming thing about this long period that I've been associated with is see, like, the industry assumes that I'm under contract. So maybe, yeah. maybe that's one reason why I haven't had a lot of offers for things during this time because she's in that show. Is the siren call back to New York on yes. the stage? Yes, yeah. But again, not to the exclusion of L.A. I mean, I would, you have to, you have to, if you have a home, a little base on each place, you've got to keep it because so that you can live like a human being when you're at each place. I mean, I, for years, back and forth, and in hotels and in sublets and stuff like that, you, you aren't going to want to do that forever. And when you're young, you're, you're most fluid. And, and, you know, I was like that until I was 40. And I finally felt like I've got to, you know, I want to, you know. Put down some And roots. also you have a relationship that will hold you on one coast or the other. That, it's just really a problem having this enormous country and the industry is split on both sides of it. That's a real problem. 
and it certainly has affected me. But I had this amazing. You've done some theater here, though. You've played the. Yes, Gap I have, but uh, it's just not the same for me yeah. because I grew up on Broadway. So, it, yeah, I did. I did uh, Kinder Transport at the Geffen, and I, uh, I did, um, I did the Cocktail Hour at the Doolittle, which we had done in New York, and. I've, I've done other theater things. Um, An Unexpected Man at the Geffen, that was With, amazing. Uh, yeah, Kinder Transport was in Hollywood. The, it was the Unexpected Man, a Yasmin Reza, the woman who wrote, who wrote uh, art. art. And uh, that, was, that was a great experience. But there's just, there's just the New York experience is special, and the regional theaters as well. I've done a lot of regional theaters. So it's, uh, I certainly am, it's my happiest uh, habitat is the stage because it's where I know best what I'm doing and frankly where I'm in control of my performance. In, in the film, as you know, you're not. And you might be shown to your great advantage in a movie. Like they, they might carve out a performance that you're lucky got put together by somebody, not you, because boy, did they do a great job. So it can work both ways, but you aren't going to be putting together your performance. You aren't going to be modulating it, somebody else is. And, and the difficulty of filming. I don't know how Meryl Streep does what she does. I, I really don't know how you look at an X next to a camera lens and pretend it's your child being carried off by a Nazi officer and follow it screaming. I don't know how you do that. Uh, and she is just a complete genius. It's very, very hard film acting, I think. I think stage acting is a lot easier. But I just know, I just know what I'm doing there. And in terms of a comedy, Oh please! If you're you know, on stage in a comedy, you are running. That you're making it. You're making it work. It's not an accident. It's a lot more satisfying. Yeah, it's it, an actors' meeting. It is. It is clearly. Yeah. It's an absolutely an actors' meeting. And television, I guess, is a writers' meeting. Film is a directors' meeting. And they're all satisfying in different ways. Very. Yeah. Well, everyone watching is going to be uh, is going to be thinking about you for their for their film. Yeah. <laughs> well, my nephew, uh, Brad Anderson, is my, I've been in two of his pictures, Happy Accidents and Next Up Wonderland, and they are amongst my favorite roles and favorite parts. Favorite yeah, movies. he's a They're terrific wonderful. director. He is. He is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we have some late. questions from, from the audience written. Okay. I'm, I'm, I've been told that I have to take the cards, and some of these things may have been covered. Uh, well, here's one from Edward. If you had to pick one role, which role has had the largest impact on your personal life? Uh, Anne Richards, absolutely, because it was a, a once-in-a-lifetime phenomenal thing that nobody believed would ever happen or could ever happen. It was just a freak. It was a freak thing that was driven by me for six years. And so it was, a, it was, it was the accomplishment of a lifetime that there was nowhere in the stars where that was written. No one would have ever thought that I could write a play that would get to the Kennedy Center and Lincoln Center, that I'd perform it by myself at my age, which is 70, 71 now, that I would do that. You know, it, and even I'd say, I say, I still saw, I'm, it's so, it was such an odd thing. And you surprised so, yourself, it I, sounds I, like. Oh, sometimes I think about it now, I said, did I do that? What was that? <laughs> and I look at so many pictures from it and stuff, in fact, I have a Facebook page that was only about the play that I started the first when we first did it in 2010. It's just under my name if anybody wants to look at it. And it's sort of was just a few highlights from the whole history of the thing and comments. But then I now think I have so many pictures from the whole run in New York and people coming back and everything that I might just start posting them one a day because I wasn't po I haven't posted since I since the play particularly because that page is about the play. So and yeah. biggest event ever. And also she influenced me in how I live. How so? Well, uh, I guess I, I mean, by just even doing it, she, she was a risk taker. And she took chances and she did things all the way. And it, I say it practically killed me doing that show. It did practically kill me. I'm still paying for it emotionally in various ways. Uh, it's sort of like, uh, well, God forbid, I can't truly compare it to this, but a metaphor for it would be, you know, losing a, a child. Because I worked for it, you know, I was involved in it, and all the people that I adore, her, her colleagues, her cohorts, her family, 
all these people who embrace me and who, like Cecile says, Holland feels like one of the family now. And all the people I was close to had reason to talk to. We had did lots of things together. And then the crew, the the designers, the set designer who did, you know, we did seven theaters. The 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 director, the the, the producers who were hands on. All, all these people that I had to dealt with every day, the crew, the people that I, you know, I hired and fired. And then, and then this unbelievable effort, this was a two and a half hour prep at least, or three hour prep, you know, eight a week. Uh, I hardly slept. I would be so amped when I'd come off. When I would come off stage after this thing, after having, you know, you know, driven this thing for two hours on this huge stage, and you have to deal with all directions. You, you can't just, you do it like this, you have to include everyone. You have to keep turning and twisting and including. After I'd come off after this, and it was so emotionally affecting. People were, particularly the first uh, months of the run when people were eager to see it because they knew about her, in a really emotional states was over. I came off stage feeling like I could drive an ambulance through the streets of Rome at night. You know, it's just like. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you go home and you eat the leftovers and the labor of, you know, taking off your makeup and preparing yourself for bed and doing all those boring things, which was all my life was. You know, I, and looking at the emails and answering many of them because they're all about business. I had, you know, authority in this production. I had to do a lot of business. I went out, in 151 performances, I went out once after the show. Wow. And I paid for it. Well, it was it was uh, uh, Frank Rich and Fran Leibowitz, and I couldn't say no. But I had a matinee the next day, and it was like, oh wow! And you know, it, it was just. I, I, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's our last question of the evening. I think we pretty Is much that the covered. Last, or we covered. Well, we've got all the one others? more okay. uh, from Ann Licketer if I'm pronouncing it right. I and feel like two questions doesn't seem fair. I don't what, know. Well, we covered, we, we actually oh, oh fortunately God, we covered, time? we covered them and we're, we're almost okay. out of time. Okay. What project character you would you like to do, explore, create that you haven't done yet? Anything come to mind? Nothing, uh, nothing really comes to mind because I'm of an age where I can no longer play some of the great characters that I would have liked to have played. Um, and I don't think so much in terms of, huh? They can CGI you. They can take you. <laughs> CGI they can do it. Right. I would, I would love to play a naturalistic part in a movie where uh, the character did something big or was something big. I, I, I'd like to play a long, complex, real person that revealed something about life. I mean, what I can I don't know who that would be or what Is there that would some be. template of what you would think about that's mm -hmm. like that that's mm -hmm. of recently? Well, I mean, most of these things are about men because men, are, are, well, there's been changing mores, but most plays that have a central central character who is, well, for lack of a better word, heroic in the sense that is making a journey, and journeys are always of discovery. Mm -hmm. And in discovery, there is revelation, and that's when the audience learns something. So that's likely to be a, a, a male role. Sometimes it's female. I remember, I remember, in fact, astonishingly, I remember no detail about this, but the great Edith Evans, when she was very old, played a big part in the movie, where the, she was the she was the hero. Hmm. And I I I remember everyone's astonishment that such a movie existed, and of course it was it, it was a great success. But um, no, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what it would be. I mean, like all of us, I think I'm, I'm like everybody. I just want to express something worth expressing in a, in a big way. And it's it's so ludicrous that I ask this as though I don't get anything because look, I did it. I did Anne, so I should be happy. And we were talking the other day. It's it's hard for you when you're not working. Oh, nice. very hard. Oh, I'm just about crazy. I had a terrible weekend. I mean, really, just <laughs> wretched. Like, what am I alive for? What am I, you know, what, what's, what's, you know, what's going to happen to me? I've got to get a dog. I mean, I, you know, what, I'm, I'm so lonely. I'm just, what am I going to do? It's, this is insane. 
You may need a hobby. <laughs> well, I do, you know, I have hobbies, but here's the thing. I'll bet you that a lot of you have felt like this. You get a part and everything's wonderful and suddenly you're interested in so many other things because you are enlivened and you feel settled and you're okay now. Okay, I'm in this and that's good. I must read that book. You know, and I'm thinking it's so unfortunate that when I'm not working, I'm so upended and weird and displaced and homeless and pathetic that I can't do the things that I'm that that I have real interest in. Well, that's the tragedy of uh, having a passion for your work. Isn't I well, it? I think it's more than having a passion for it. It's it's not so much that. It's that I my selfhood is too linked to it for mental health. <laughs> and I bet that's true of a lot of you. That yes, it's it it's, is true. It, I, my sure. self, if I don't feel like I, I'm not okay. I mean, somebody you know. has to watch I so, you I play. Feel okay, somebody has to watch me play. So it's really, I, I swear to God. Well, we've enjoyed watching you play tonight. <laughs> it's been lovely.